Father Luke Dingman is a parish priest at St. Lawrence Orthodox Christian Church in Felton, California. The lovely, peaceful San Lorenzo River runs behind his backyard, overlooked by his home and studio. Some years ago, Father Luke used stones from this river to build a small chapel where he says his daily prayers or counsels people. During the course of this video, Father Luke will be creating six large icons depicting the life and martyrdom of St. Lawrence of Rome. When completed, these icons will fill the back wall of the nave of St. Lawrence Church. The film portrays Father Luke's struggle to complete this masterwork before his advancing Parkinson's disease renders him incapable. We'll follow along as he works and learn the 12 basic steps of the ancient art of Byzantine iconography. Icons themselves will tell us the fascinating story of St. Lawrence, a third century deacon and martyr who is beloved by Christians of both East and West. In spite of the challenges posed by his Parkinson's disease, Father Luke still assists with various parish duties as he is able. Today brings the light of salvation to us, brothers and sisters. Today is the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Upon these your servants, Jean Maurice, Sarah Elizabeth. Early, early on, St. Luke painted images, icons, that's what it means in Greek, of uh, his Holy Mother and, and some of the saints. And there's some of those that still exist today. I saw one in Jerusalem. And uh, they're very dark and very old, but they're, they're, they're quite beautiful. For Orthodox, when you go into church, uh, you're not just in a place of uh, blank walls. You see saints and angels and Christ all over, everywhere. And these are the invisible made visible. And uh, the great cloud of witnesses that are in heaven are there with you in their images and their icons. The theological reason we can paint icons and we do paint icons is because God became man in the person of Jesus Christ and uh, took on real human flesh. We could see him, we could touch him, and, uh, and we could portray him. The evangelist Luke, author of the Gospel of Luke, painted the very first icon. It was an image of the Virgin Mary. 
In icons, she is almost always shown with Christ, either holding him as a child or following him in his ministry. We have icons of saints who are alive in Christ, who are interceding for us. Icons that represent historic events or stories of Christ and his saints, and icons that depict the good things God has done for us. Through seeing and venerating these icons, we can honor God and his saints and keep their memories alive in our hearts. The first of the 12 steps in the creation of an icon is research. In creating a new icon, it has always been important for the icon painter to look for many images. I begin by searching my collection of books on icons and to gather as many previous prototypes of good Byzantine icons of the saints or subjects I will be depicting. I have collected many books on icons as I could find and afford. I search these books for the subjects or saints that I will be painting. I also have extensive files containing photos and prints of icons from my travels to churches in the United States, Greece, Russia, and the Holy Land. Often, from what I have found in my files and books, I will have 20, 30, or sometimes even more prototypes from many different countries and spanning many centuries. And, of course, now we have the World Wide Web where, with just a few clicks, you can find hundreds, even thousands of images. The ones you need or choose for referral can be easily printed out. As I look over these many examples spread out before me, I take note of what is common to all or most all then take note of where there can be some individual choices and in creativity by the artist. Since the beginning of the church, icons have been used in Orthodox worship. Icons have always been a part of my life as well. In addition to having icons in our churches, most Orthodox Christians have icons in their homes. These holy images remind us that God is everywhere present and fills all things, and He is always with us. When we invite Him into our home in this way, we invite him into our lives and are reminded to enter his presence to seek healing, grace, and love. But the use of icons in worship has not been without controversy. In the 8th century, iconoclasm rose in the Christian church. Icon smashers, those who persecuted, exiled, tortured, and even maimed iconographers and those who supported the use of iconography in worship. Today, there are still religions who believe that the use of images in worship should be forbidden. Others simply believe that we are worshiping idols of wood and paint. But the reality is that icons are windows to heaven, a means by which we remember and honor those Christians who have gone on before us. St. Luke is the patron saint of iconographers, and I have an icon of him in my studio. This is where I say the iconographer's prayer. O divine Lord of all that exists, thou hast illumined the apostle and evangelist Luke with thy Holy Spirit. Saint Luke, pray for me. Thereby enabling him to represent thy most holy mother, the one who held thee in her arms and says, the grace of him who has been born of me is spread throughout the world. Enlighten and direct my heart, my soul, and my spirit. Guide the hands of thine unworthy servant, Luke, that I may worthily and perfectly portray thine icon, that of thy mother, of St. Lawrence, deacon martyr, patron of our church in this valley, and of all the saints, for the glory, joy, and adornment of thy holy church. Forgive my sins and the sins of those who will venerate these icons, and who, kneeling devoutly before them, give homage to those they represent. Protect them from all evil. Instruct them with good counsel. This I ask through the intercessions of thy most holy mother, the Apostle Luke, St. Lawrence, and of all the saints, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. I usually draw to scale a series of small, rough thumbnail sketches of what I have found to be all the important elements paying special attention to layout and proportions. In the preliminary sketches of the life and martyrdom of St. Lawrence, I made choices of what to include and how many figures and objects will be in each scene. 
When I was doing my research and found elements of consistency among the icons, I took that as holy tradition. So while doing these sketches, I stay faithful as best I can to those elements. It is important to stay true to the older, accepted and blessed images rather than to innovate, improvise and create one's own version. On the first Sunday of Lent every year, the Orthodox Church worldwide celebrates the end of iconoclasm and the triumph of the Orthodox veneration of icons. To show their love for these visible depictions of their faith, Orthodox Christians make a grand procession all the way around the outside of the church building. The clergy and altar servers lead the way, holding large icons and banners from inside the church. The choir and the other parishioners follow, each person holding an icon brought from home to participate in this blessing. Prepare the board, canvas, or other surface that the icon will be painted on. Most smaller portable icons are painted on boards that have been coated with multiple layers of gesso. Gesso is a preparation of white pigment in an adhesive base. This gesso coating has been used for centuries as a good painting surface on boards, canvas, and even on walls. Most of the large icons that I paint that are to be applied to church walls are painted on artist canvas which comes coated with a gesso surface. I usually use the 6 foot by 18 foot size rolls measuring and cutting the canvas to fit the icon I will be painting. Then I pin the canvas to my studio wall with push pins. This makes it easy to move the canvas around to paint different portions or to remove it as needed. I draw a grid on the canvas to match the grid that I have previously drawn on the small sketch. This makes it easier to get the correct dimensions when drawing out the icon onto the large canvas. With a pencil, I begin to draw the actual icon with all of its elements. I usually pen or tape the small finished sketch to the wall, but you can also use photos of icons or reference drawings that will be useful to you. I refer to my sketches as I draw the details of the backgrounds, buildings, costumes, and clothing of the icon. When the pencil drawing on the canvas is completed, I use a small pointed brush to carefully go over all the pencil lines with dark brown paint. I like to use burnt umber. I thin the paint with water so that it will flow evenly from the brush like ink. In the ancient text, this type of drawing was traditionally called the cartoon. Then I erase any extra pencil sketch lines and grid lines and clean up any smudges of graphite. This leaves a clean, finished drawing ready to be painted. An iconographer always paints the darkest colors first, then the next lighter colors working up to the palest highlights. 
I begin by filling in the dark ground colors of the background. This includes natural features such as sky, cliffs, trees, plants, and architecture. I move on to the garments, figures, and so forth. When the dark ground of each area has been filled in, I begin to highlight and add detail, working from dark to light. My son Aaron helps me to place the canvas on a flat surface so that I can begin to add white dots on the edges of St. Lawrence garments. The round dots are called pearls and are easily and quickly done by dipping old brush handles of various sizes into the white paint and gently pressing them on the border design. Father Luke started his artistic career using many different styles. time I was doing wildlife painting and cartooning and illustration and iconography. As I began to paint icons for our church and for Orthodox churches, I became somewhat well known and, and uh, was doing some big churches and large icons. And I did this for a number of years and then I noticed that I would be painting and I'd drop a brush. And then something I do every day, big uh, bucket of water cleaning out a brush. I had to think about gripping the brush and sticking it in the water. I had no idea I had a brain disease that uh, was incurable. And it just, things were more difficult. This monk and a good friend of mine for over 35 years had Parkinson's disease. And he asked me to do some cartoons for the Parkinson's uh, journal uh, newsletter, and I did. And then he asked me to take him to some of the Parkinson's support group meetings, and I did. He noticed that one arm just was always up, and he says, you got Parkinson's. And I th said, no, no. Uh, I can do anything I can do everything. I don't walk like you. But I found out because I looked on the internet and saw the symptoms that I had about six out of eight of them. So I uh, got the diagnosis. Once I started taking the, the medicines, uh, could paint all day, could uh, do almost everything. And then it, as time went on, I had to take more pills more often, and have less productive time during a day. When Father Luke began studying art, he never dreamed he would one day struggle with Parkinson's. He also never dreamed he would spend most of his career painting icons. Icons belonged to an entirely different world. 
When I got into college, I took all the art I could possibly take, and one of our professors happened to be the period of time when icons were discussed. We, we started with cavemen, you know, and things, on, and then you go back through the ancient times, and then they talked about icons. Now, the professor was pretty good. He, was, uh, he could usually keep you awake, but he didn't know, I found out later, much about it. He would say that icons are uh, kind of primitive. They don't know about shadows. They don't know about uh, perspective. They, you know, they're kind of a flat. And he, he, he said they're kind of pretty and esoteric and mysterious, but we don't, you know, he just moved on after a while. Everything in an orthodox icon is done for a reason, and uh, a, usually a spiritual, mystical reason, and not to be realistic, sensual, natural. Uh, they, they purposely change, enhance, stylize, and design everything to be otherworldly a vehicle of God's grace and not try to uh, be just real and natural. And so, things that we thought were primitive, that, that, that they didn't know perspective, they have inverse perspective because it's a window to heaven and sometimes, you know, things in, in perspective, everything has a vanishing point. And, uh, and there's no shadows because there's divine light. The figures, rather than uh, rosy cheeks and big luscious lips and all the kind of things that developed in religious art during the Renaissance, they look ascetical, they look spiritual, big eyes, uh, small noses, small lips and uh, d various poses too that are just spiritual and not naturalistic and physical, sensual. All areas of the icon that include flesh, faces, hands, and feet are painted with a base coat of an olive color. This color is called Sankir. Byzantine hands are stylized, simplified, and elegant. The outlined edges are usually done in a warm red-brown color. I use straight burnt sienna. Then the pink flesh color is painted over certain areas, leaving some of the Sankir showing. Finally, a mixture of the yellow flesh color is painted on smaller areas to highlight and give dimension to the hand. The main thing, Parkinson's or any kind of disease that takes away your ability to do what you did before and makes it more difficult is uh, humility. It teaches you great humility because you are not able to quickly, easily do what you used to do. You have times when you, uh, just like we, we say, hit a wall, turn the switch off, where you just, you, you begin to get stiff, you begin to get, uh, I get negative and whiny and depressed. And as a priest, I spend a lot of my time 
cheering people up, uh, telling them to uh, count their blessings. I give. I know all the verses about enduring suffering and and uh, having a positive outlook on life. But when I'm in an off period, I can barely control my fingers. And most of art is up here, and I've had a, you know all that experience. But to make it come out this way, and, and I find that when I'm at that stage, I just go read something, I can pray, but I can't do effective art. The first three icons are now finished, except for the gold leaf that will be applied to all the halos. My granddaughter Sophia and I carefully apply a coating of the gold leaf sizing, a type of slow drying varnish that remains tacky for a number of hours. I use a water based sizing from Germany that is much less toxic and smelly than the old oil based sizings iconographers used for many years. We usually wait at least 15 to 20 minutes for the sizing to reach its maximum tackiness. The gold leaf comes in sheets, lightly adhered to a paper backing. We lay the sheet gold side down over the halo area where the sizing has been applied and gently rub the paper backing to release the gold leaf. We then rub the area to which the gold leaf has stuck more firmly, repeating until the entire halo area is covered, overlapping the gold slightly and being careful not to waste a lot of gold leaf. We remove the sheet, then taking a soft bristle brush, we brush off the extra pieces of gold leaf that have not stuck to the halo and collect them in a jar. When the jar is full, I'll retire. We keep brushing until all the loose gold flecks are gone and the surface of the halo appears as one solid field of gold. Finally, we outline the gold halos with red paint and touch up the head, hair, and shoulder areas of the figures with paint if needed. When the gold leafing is finished and all the corrections, changes, and enhancements are done, I pin the icon outside on my studio wall and spray it with two to three thin, even coats of picture varnish. This seals them and protects the icons during installation and makes them able to be cleaned of soot and dust with a soft, damp cloth without damaging the holy images. First, the canvas is trimmed to fit the area precisely. Then the icon is laid face down on a clean plastic. Heavy-duty wallpaper adhesive is carefully applied to the whole back of the icon with all the strokes on the edges going outward. The icon is lifted into place. Gently rubbing the icon from the middle outward gets rid of any bubbles and excess paste. We use damp rags to wipe the excess paste from the edges, then use clean, dry rags to get rid of any residue. Glory.
Holy water is water blessed by an Orthodox Christian bishop or priest for various purposes, including baptism, for healing from illness, for spiritual protection, and for sanctifying, that is, setting apart places and objects for Christian use. Icons are consecrated with holy water and prayer. Through this blessing, the grace of the Holy Spirit is imparted to the icon, and we reverence the icon to partake of this grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lawrence was born in Spain, then educated in Rome in the mid-third century. As a young man, he showed himself to be devoted and virtuous. Archdeacon Sixtus, who had been Lawrence's mentor, became bishop or pope of Rome in 257. He ordained Lawrence to the diaconate and elevated him to the position of archdeacon. Pope Sixtus put Lawrence in charge of the church's treasury with the duty of distributing money to the poor. Lawrence discharged this duty diligently and faithfully, and the poor loved him. In that same year of 257, Emperor Valerian decreed that all Christian bishops, priests, and deacons be put to death. The following year, Pope Sixtus was arrested along with four deacons as he served the liturgy in a catacomb church. Pope Sixtus and the deacons were taken to the pagan temple of Mars, where they were commanded to offer sacrifice. Instead, Pope Sixtus prayed that the Lord would crush the pagan deity. The temple immediately toppled and the statue of Mars was smashed. Archdeacon Lawrence, seeing his beloved bishop about to be martyred, begged to be allowed to die with him. But Pope Sixtus assured Lawrence that he, a strong young man, would very soon suffer even more greatly for Christ. In the meantime, Sixtus commanded Lawrence to distribute all the treasures of the church to the poor. Pope Sixtus and the other four deacons were then beheaded on a hill opposite the rubble of the Temple of Mars. They suffered on August 6th and were buried in the catacombs. Archdeacon Lawrence was arrested but not put to death because the soldiers had heard Pope Sixtus entrust him with the treasures of the church. When Lawrence refused to reveal where these treasures were hidden, Emperor Valerian commanded that he be imprisoned under the commander Hippolytus. Among Lawrence's fellow prisoners was a pagan named Lucilius, who was completely blind. Lawrence asked him if he would like to be illuminated in both body and soul through baptism. Lucilius gladly agreed. Lawrence asked for water and baptized him, and Lucilius came out of the water healed of his blindness. Commander Hippolytus witnessed this and was persuaded of the power of the Christian God. After talking at length with Lawrence, he agreed to be baptized. He took Lawrence to his home, where Lawrence baptized Hippolytus' entire household. They then returned to the prison. The small picture at the bottom, over the water, depicts Hippolytus' later martyrdom, three days after that of St. Lawrence. Emperor Valerian summoned Archdeacon Lawrence to his presence and demanded that he turn over the treasures of the church. Lawrence agreed, provided he could have three days to collect them, with Hippolytus as his guard. Lawrence gathered all the worldly treasures the church in Rome possessed, 
liturgical vessels and candlesticks made of gold, silver, and precious stones, and sold them to the wealthy. He then gathered the poor and needy, the sick, the lame, and the blind, at Commander Hippolytus' house. There he distributed to them all the proceeds of the sale of the church's worldly goods. When it was time to present the treasures of the church to Emperor Valerian, Lawrence presented him instead with the needy people he had just provided for. Place your treasure in these human vessels by giving them assistance, and you will be recompensed a hundredfold in the kingdom of heaven, he told the emperor. Valerian, furious at having been tricked, commanded that Lawrence be taken away to undergo a series of vicious tortures. He was stung with scorpions and then beaten repeatedly with a variety of cruel implements, but Lawrence remained steadfast. One of the soldiers, named Romanus, saw an angel healing Lawrence's wounds, and he begged Lawrence to remember him. On the spot, Romanus brought Lawrence a bucket of water and begged to be baptized. Romanus was immediately arrested and taken away to be beheaded. Valerian and his co-emperor Gallienus decreed that Archdeacon Lawrence should be put to death by being slowly roasted over a gridiron. Lawrence endured his trial with patient cheerfulness, praying for the conversion of all Rome. When the emperors exhorted him to deny Christ and save himself from the flames, he responded, These coals roast my body, but refresh my soul. Later, he suggested his torturers should turn him over as he was done on one side. He then gave thanks to Christ for being counted worthy of martyrdom and delivered his soul into the hands of God. Commander Hippolytus, along with the priest Justin, took Lawrence's body to the home of the widow Kyriaka, whom Lawrence had previously healed of a painful disease. Many Christians assembled there to pray for his soul. The body was then taken to a cave on the same property, where Lawrence was interred with honor and reverence. His suffering took place on August 10th. St. Lawrence became one of Rome's most famous and treasured martyrs, credited by some with the city's eventual conversion. After Christianity was legalized, five Roman basilicas were dedicated to him, including the church built over the tomb to which his relics were transferred, St. Lawrence outside the walls. As a native Spaniard, St. Lawrence is also very popular in Spain. In 1769, the Spanish Portola expedition explored the area surrounding the Monterey Bay on the central California coast. In the coastal mountains, among the majestic redwood trees, they discovered a beautiful river flowing through a steep valley down to the bay. They named it the San Lorenzo River after St. Lawrence. Our parish, located in the heart of the San Lorenzo Valley, found it fitting to adopt St. Lawrence as our patron and to invoke the blessing of this great saint on our whole community. Depicted at the front of this procession are several members of our parish who have fallen asleep in the Lord. They, along with St. Lawrence, are always praying for us. And he says to you on this day, as he said to generations of clergy, be firm in your faith and hold true. Stand as a witness and a beacon of light in this world. Be like St. Lawrence of Rome, who was filled with courage, who was not afraid to speak out and proclaims God, God's truth. He was a servant of the poor and the weak. He was a minister to the humblest people of God. And if you are indeed to be a real clergyman and a servant as a deacon, you must serve those whom no one else would care for. Thank you.
In the six years it has taken me to paint these icons of the life of St. Lawrence, my Parkinson's has relentlessly advanced, making it more and more difficult to do what used to come so easy. Illness forces humility upon you. For Parkinson's, it's the awkwardness of uncontrollable movements or the opposite, frozen immobility. At times, it takes every ounce of determination to force yourself even to take a step when you know others are waiting on you to move. St. Lawrence has become one of my heroes. I have learned much by being immersed in his life and the life of those who came to Christ during his last days. I have been inspired by their courage as they suffered persecution and martyrdom. Through their example, God has been teaching me humility, patience, kindness for others, and to give thanks and glory to God in all things. Difficulties in this life happen to all of us. How we face them is up to us. God will give us the grace to do so, just as he did St. Lawrence. By God's grace, I plan to keep painting icons for our church as long as I am able. I often use this ancient prayer that reminds me of who God is and of my need for his mercy and love. Perhaps it'll be useful to you. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Thank you.